Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Harold Pollack from the University of Chicago, and I want to talk about the, the index card approach to personal finance and uh, some, some simple rules that you can follow and a little bit about my own story uh, as a person uh, who never paid too much attention to this uh, you know, for much of my life. Um, there, I would say, like many Americans, I was basically a complete financial screw up until age 40. Uh, I really didn't, I stayed poorly, I didn't have a budget or a financial plan. I pretty much made every stupid mistake that a smart person can make. And I made all those mistakes despite being a successful researcher with, you know, sort of every academic box, uh, you know, in an American context checked in my life. I was an undergraduate at Princeton. I was an engineer at MIT. I got my doctorate from Harvard. I was an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. And uh, I certainly had the skills to pay attention to my financial life. I just ne never did. And I remember uh, around 2003, I was given a, uh, a major opportunity at the University of Chicago, where I now teach. I was offered tenure, which is a big deal in the United States. Uh, and the University of Chicago, to recruit me, gave me the down payment for my house. I, I didn't have a house. I had no money. I had nothing. And, uh, and they gave me the down payment. And they also sent me to a banker at a place called Harris Bank in Chicago. And, uh, and I showed up at the bank and I, was, and I was really in that rush that a newly tenured professor has. You know, I would go up to people and start describing my research in great detail. And they would say, uh, sir, this is, uh, this is McDonald's. Please just order your hamburger and move on. Uh, and and I, I go to this banker and I start describing this super expensive house I want to buy and how I had used a mortgage calculator to buy it and that University of Chicago's down payment was going to make it possible for me. And at some point I took a breath and this bank said to me, uh, Dr. Pollock, I have to tell you something. You're not a good customer. You're 40 years old. You basically have no money except for what the university gave you. And if it doesn't work out at the university, you want that money back. And, you know, talking to you because the University of Chicago asked me to talk to you, you just have to really uh, lower your expectations and buy a less expensive house. And I remember I was kind of rude to that gentleman. And it turned out he was the best financial professional I've ever dealt with because we bought a less expensive house. And we moved to Chicago. And then about four months after we moved in, my mother-in-law died quite tragically. And her, her son, my, my wife's brother, who lives with an intellectual disability called Fragile X Syndrome, had to move into our house. My wife had to, had to leave her job to take care of him. And we just had an incredible financial crisis. I remember he weighed 340 pounds. So we had to buy new furniture. That he could that he could fit in, and that we bought a a, a, a lazy boy lounge chair, and it was about nine hundred dollars. And I remember buying this chair and just thinking, in a very matter of fact way, you know, I'm going to hemorrhage all my money. Uh, and I became obsessed with personal finance, like, okay, how do I actually do this and manage my money? And uh, one of the striking things is uh, that. Uh, I offhandedly mentioned in, in a video chat uh, some of the things that I was learning. And but I think that, that that's really why I'm here is, is to talk about some of those things that I learned and, and how I came to that. Because what I found when I was obsessed with uh, finance, and I started reading about it, was that the actual experts on personal finance, what they were saying about investing and saving was so much simpler than what you would get if you say turned on financial cable TV or started reading, you know, magazines that are trying to get you to invest in stuff. And, and, um, and I remember I had a blog at the time, a video blog, and I was on a, a video chat with the author, Helene Olin, who, who's a, a financial writer, wrote a great book called Pound Foolish. And I just mentioned to her offhandedly, you know, the best investment advice that you can get it would fit on an index card and it's available for free in the library. And all of a sudden, I started getting deluged with emails that said, you know, dude, where's the card? And, you know, I was just talking, uh, you know, I, I, um, so I, I was a little bit stuck, but I had sort of, you know, put my foot around. I said it was really simple. Uh, and so I felt, you know, I really had to do it. And I just grabbed one of my daughter's little four by six inch index cards 
And, uh, and I just wrote in maybe two minutes, I scribbled down nine rules on a card uh, and, you know, there's uh, no reason 15 year old couldn't follow these rules. Uh, although, of course, actually uh, following them religiously you know, when it comes to, you know, saving and investing, that's a different matter for many of us. But the concepts are very simple. Uh, and I took a picture with my iPhone and I posted it on the web and I got 400,000 hits. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And I'm going to talk you through some of what I said in that card. Some of what I wrote is U.S. specific, you know, about the U.S. tax system and some of the incentives we have in America for, for retirement savings. That's not interesting to, to you. But a lot of it, you know, is very applicable to everybody. Here's the card that I wrote. And that's my kitchen table in the background. You can see uh, it's got uh, my bad handwriting, which I actually think, as I've mentioned, is part of why it was popular. So some of the things that I said in that card. You know, buy inexpensive, well-diversified index funds, uh, you know, like the Vanguard Target, uh, you know, 2050 funds is an example, but all the major vendors have examples like that. Never buy or sell an individual stock. The person on the other side of the table knows more than you do about their stuff. And I'll come back to that one. Save 20% of your money. I think actually many people in India are way ahead of where most Americans are, but many Americans... Uh, struggle to be above zero there. Uh, pay your credit card balance off in full every month. That's so important. Pay attention to fees when you invest. Avoid mutual funds that are trying to pick winners and losers. They, they, they don't do that very effectively. I have some advice about financial advisors, which, uh, which is made in the American context. And I should say also support the social safety net to help people when things go wrong. So this card goes viral, goes ridiculously viral. The Washington Post, this four by six index card has all the financial advice you'll ever need. I was in the New York Times, National Public Radio. I was on American public television. And I, one of the things that I said is you shouldn't spend your money on stuff you don't care about. And I don't care about my car. So I had this old cheap car and the reporter was showing all the little rust spots and dents on my crummy old car. My wife wasn't super thrilled with that one, but, uh, but it did make the point. Uh, various websites said, you know, your new financial advisors, Harold Pollock's 4 by 6 X card, all the financial investment advice you'll ever need is on one card and so on. Team started emailing me requesting autographed copies. Uh, and, and, you know, it was just, I never expected that. It was kind of a random, random viral internet thing. And I should say it became a book. Helene and I wrote a book. Uh, called the index card why personal finance doesn't have to be complicated you can buy it at amazon and any other uh retailer and i, I hope that you do uh and you know this book was very simple uh, i'm an academic researcher i do a lot of complicated public health research i think i may have done more good with the book and the index card than almost anything else that i've done because it was so simple and because people could really relate to it and the idea that if you follow simple rules on this card that you could put on your refrigerator would make your life better. That seems to be helpful for a lot of people. Uh, I should say I won Money Magazine's uh, New Idea of the Year Award. And I'm at the University of Chicago where we have any Nobel Prize winning economists and so on. And they heard that I won this award and they, and hey, what did you do? And, I, and then they found the card and they're like, this is it? Like, you're kidding. Like I do like real serious Nobel Prize winning economics research. I've never won this type of thing. And, and you won that with this thing that everybody knows. And that's kind of the point. It was very simple and it was helpful to people. Uh, by the way, here's an article I wrote in the Atlantic that was based on it. You know, the best investing advice is always boring for TV. Uh, notice, by the way, the ad in the corner, completely contrary to the advice that I'm giving. Uh, one of the problems we have in finance is that is that uh, you know the best advice is boring and it's not particularly lucrative. Uh, so why did I get so much attention? I think my horrible handwriting helped humanize that. The fact that I'm such a B plus role model in my personal life about financial issues uh, seemed to be helpful to people. You know, you don't have to be perfect to be an effective saver and investor. You know, saving and investing are such forbidding and complex subjects. That it really helps a lot of us to reduce those things to some simple rules. Uh, and, you know, personal finance challenges are also, they're at once 
intimate and universal. You know, one of the things that I say to folk is money is definitely not the most important thing in your life, but whatever is the most important thing in your life has a financial dimension. And whatever is the most a little bit centric or crazy or things that you have trouble dealing with in your personal life, that also shows up in the way you manage your money. Family relationships, uh, your personal approach to making decisions, it shows up in your money in big ways. And we see this, for example, when we look at bored young people who are trading on Robinhood and these other gamified investment apps, and now crypto, which I'm really concerned about. I think a lot of young people are, are, are enticed to do things that are not great when all the academic evidence is low fee index funds are going to do much better than any of these other things. In the United States, we have a lot of bored middle-aged day traders who watch financial cable TV and they're, and they're uh, cranking away uh, buying and selling stock too much. And, there, and also senior citizens who are worried that they haven't saved enough money for retirement who are fall prey to investment schemes. Uh, one of the interesting things that's really striking is the way that the self-help uh, folk are often helpful in personal finance in a way that those of us who study personal finance from a sort of mathematical perspective didn't always appreciate. You know, Deepak Chopra has this book, Creating Affluence, that a lot of people found helpful. And this person over here on the right is named Susie Orman. She's a financial guru in the United States, and she's often on television. And I was watching it one time. I watched her show for the first time. You know, when I and and she's giving advice, and I'm thinking, you know, if I have a half a million dollar stock portfolio, her advice, oh my god, it's terrible, it's way too conservative. Like, this would be the worst possible advice for an upper middle class professor at the University of Chicago with a you know, with a half million dollar 401k or whatever. 401k is an American savings, and then I realized, oh, that's not who that's not what she's doing, all she knows how to do is to help millions of people live better financial lives. And a lot of her advice is psychological. It's things like, you know what? Don't let your boyfriend spend your money. If you're depressed, don't go shopping. It's not rocket science. <laughs> Actually, though, incredibly helpful for a lot of people. Uh, let's start with some good things about how people budget and save. They're, um, the, the greatest reward that I've found and that many people find if you, if you budget and you get on a good financial plan is that your life is just so much less stressful and you actually can be strategic about your money. You know, whatever income is, if you're scrambling to manage your cash flow, hoping that you'll make it to the next paycheck, you're just not going to be strategic. You're going to make mistakes. I certainly did. Uh, and, um, and I think everybody does. You want to be on a plan, have a strategic reserve, have a budget, then it's a lot easier to really follow uh, you know, a good strategy. How do I save my money? I would say whatever way gives you what in America we call mojo, your momentum, your sense of immediate gratification, that jolt that you get like when you have a great cup of coffee. The, the strategy that helps you save, that gives you that mojo, that's the one that's going to work because you're going to follow it. Investment goes. You know, the best portfolio is kind of boring. Investing your money is a little bit like taking out the trash. It's something that you do, that, that you're responsible about, uh, but you don't spend a lot of time freaking out about it uh, and, and uh, you know, doing all sorts of wild maneuvers. You know, there's really no time or reason to read the business page every day and make a serious investment decision. One of the things that Helene and I write in our book is uh, people should invest like a girl. Women are better investors than men and it's because women are better at not doing. And in terms of your spending, one of the things that we say is your high calorie food should at least taste good. Your goal is not to be in a financial starvation diet, but it's to be planful about what you spend on, particularly the big things, your home, your car. You know, you can always stop going out for coffee if you need to spend less money. You cannot uh, skip your mortgage payment. Uh, here's an example of how you can get your mojo. Here's a, here's a mom with her daughter. They're walking down the street, say in the in main street in a big city, and they pass a department store, a, uh, a fantastic sweater in the window. And, and mom looks at her and says, you know, Rhea, um, that sweater would be awesome on me. It's just perfect skin tone. I don't look nerdy wearing that sweater. That would be awesome. But you know what? That sweater is $80. 
I'm not going to buy that sweater right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get $80 and I'm going to put it in an account to help pay for your college. And someday you're going to do the same thing for your daughter. Now, what have I done? I've taken um, that temptation to buy that sweater and I've resisted it by making a fantastic moment with my daughter. As a parent, I'm like, I just rocked it. I just had a great moment with my daughter. I taught her an important lesson. And, and that's really fun, even though I would have liked to have had that $80 sweater. Those are the kinds of things that you want to, that you want to be doing that give you mojo to save. Well, here, this is my aspirational camera. Uh, there, um, um, this is, I don't actually own this camera, but if I do 10 more uh, conferences like this, I'll buy one. This is a $13,000 camera. I did take these pictures last week with, with my nice camera that I do have. And you can criticize anything about my presentation except for the pictures. You get kicked out of the conference if you criticize my pictures. But I like to spend money on my camera. People have things I like to spend money on. Credit cards. Credit cards are a high interest loan disguised as a poker chip. I really think, especially talking with our children and with ourselves, pay your credit card bill off in full. Credit cards in the United States have a 16% interest rate. It's probably higher in India. There's no investment that you're gonna make that gives you that kind of guaranteed return. Uh, you know, much as I bet against India, I would still say my credit card interest rate is probably higher than my guaranteed return from a stock, you know, the, the Indian stock market over the next several years. Stay within your game. Don't dabble in stock picking or overcomplicated stuff. I happen to be a rabid basketball fan. These are people trying to slam dunk on much better players. This is LeBron James, maybe the greatest basketball player of all time. You're not going to dunk on him. This is Anthony Davis, a great stock uh, shot blocker. This is Shaquille O'Neal. I hope this gentleman's okay. Um, when you buy or sell a stock, the person on the other side of the table is a professional investor. And this is their day job that they're competing against. You don't want to be this guy. Uh, there's a ton of evidence uh, uh, that individual investors who are actively trading underperform the stock market by quite a bit. Uh, ben, uh, Brad Barber and Terrence Odeon probably are the most famous. They just have a whole shelf full of studies that show that men do worse than women frequent traders, even if you ignore the cost of actually doing the trades, underperform. Uh, so here's some examples. <laughs> Pathetic how bad we are. Uh, one example is the stocks that we sell tend to outperform the stocks that we buy with the money that we got from the stocks that we just sold. It's not even random. Uh, we basically chase after shiny objects and, and stocks are shiniest precisely when they're most overpriced. Uh, so, and single men on average manage to combine pathetic performance with overconfidence. That's to be what it takes to be a single man these days. And single women are just much better investors because they're able to be more disciplined. And, uh, you know, you just don't want to be a uh, highly active trade. Now, if you do, if you enjoy speculating, that's great. Take a chunk of your money, put it aside, but understand that that's, that's taken to go to a casino. That's not your strategic reserve. That's not your retirement. It's not your kid's college. I should say your investment advisor, exactly the same. Investment advisors can be awesomely helpful. And I'll talk a little bit about that as, as I close out. Uh, what, one thing they're not good at is picking winners and losers stocks. This top uh, set of bar graphs here is the percentage of, of funds that are trying to pick winners and losers that, that, that underperform the market benchmark for whatever market they're in. And they, they really dramatically underperform. And what this green is here, they especially underperform if you take into account, hey, a lot of the funds that try to do that actually closed. And so they don't, they, they're actually, uh, if you're not careful, you forget about those people when you analyze the data. And just 80 or 90% of actively managed uh, funds underperform uh, just what a, a simple index would do. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's also true of your personal financial advisor. This is a great uh, cartoon from 1940 about financial advice. It says, yes, but where are the customer's yachts? You know, if, if your personal financial advisor knew what the next Apple or Amazon was, uh, she wouldn't be talking to you. Uh, she wouldn't need to. Um, now, I do think financial advisors are incredibly helpful when used the right way. 
they're awesome in helping you uh, to not panic and to not say panic sell when the market took And during COVID, a lot of Americans started to panic sell when the market dropped and then it came back up, helping you get the basic things right. And also talk to you about uh, your family issues, what's going on in your life, being a critical uh, friend who can help you make decisions in a less passionate way. Say, I have two children. One of, one of my kids is uh, having is in financial difficulty. What's the best way to help them and be fair to my other child? Uh, you know, what should I do about my life insurance? Things like that. They're not good at, ask, at figuring out what's the best company for me to invest in. It's really how do I manage my life and how can you give me some critical advice that I might not want to hear in the moment, but that I really need to hear it. One of the ironies of this is if the best advice is simple and free, then the complicated and expensive advice is by definition probably wrong. So that's not what you should be, be paying someone to get. Uh, so uh, it is now one of the challenges I should say for advisors is that, is that people are hoping that they can get that kind of help from advisors, uh, but, um, uh, but that's not what they do. So I'm, I'm gonna stop here but I'm delighted to answer your questions. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, uh, and this is a great conference and I feel uh, very honored to participate. Thank you very much. I stop there? Oh, yes. Uh, Harold, I have a few questions for you. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Nice to talk to you. Now, if I were to ask you to distill your presentation in three piece, three rules of investing, three rules, which are the three most important ones? Oh, great question. Uh, first of all, save money and find the best strategy that works for you as a human to save effectively. Because, you know, one of the sayings that people often say is rocket science is more fun when you have rockets. You need money to invest. Don't buy or sell any individual stocks. Uh, and, and, and invest for the long run. Uh, it is year to year, lots of stuff's going to happen and, and we're real, and you really have to take a long-term view. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. So what you've told us is that there are the three simple rules are start saving, mm -hmm. figure out for yourself, what is the best way you can save? Yes. Okay. And the third one being? Invest for the long run. Invest for the long run. And, and, and I would say low fee and of course low fee index funds are the are really the most evidence based way to do that. Starting at a, the youngest age that where you can start. make compound interest your friend. Okay, okay. Now I know that I don't, that I've read your book and I really think it's fantastic. Uh, one uh, thing I wanted to ask you: it seemed to be written mostly for people who had a job, a regular job. Uh, you know, I, I was trying to figure out how would that advice change for people who are self-employed, who work uh, as businessmen, how would that advice work for them? Because they are not assured of a paycheck every month. That's a great question. I think if you're self-employed, there's both advantages and disadvantages to that. I think that you do want to have a higher savings rate if you're self-employed because your income is less predictable. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I, I think, and the other challenge when you're self-employed is to balance how much do I invest in my own business versus how much do I invest in a low, an index fund or something like that that's independent of my business. And I think each person is in their own, you know, has their own situation. Uh, but one of the things that you want to balance is uh, I want to have, I want to invest sufficiently in my business so that I can do what I need to do to be successful in my business, but I don't want all my eggs in one basket. And I, um, yeah. having diversifying that risk some uh, with good stock market investments is important for that person because you know businesses succeed and fail and you can't always predict that. Okay, uh, now uh, just curious to know: uh, have has anyone done research on the fact that how people fare following your basic rules of investing vis-a-vis -vis people who go to fancy advisors, pay them FTPs? Or you know, were self-directed investors who dabble in you know stocks daily. So has any study been carried out which validates 
uh, the yeah. things that you've written about in your book. Yes, th there's a couple of ways that people have shown that. It is uh, now a lot depends on what your advisor does for you. you know, some of the fancy advisors, if, and if you have a very complicated personal situation, the fancy advisors can be helpful. But in terms of just investing, the index funds substantially outperform the advice of professional financial advisors and funds that are run by financial by, by financial professionals that you can buy into. They're you know, actively managed funds that try to pick winners and losers, very much underperform the market. And you know, the, it's, the fees are just incredibly punishing over time. Uh, you know, if I compare a stock market fund that has, like my personal investments have a 0.1% uh, fee to invest in my index funds. Advisors often charge you 10 times that just for their time. So they'll charge you 1% of your wealth or more just for your time. And when you look at when over 20 and 30 years, what you find is that people often have, uh, you know, 20% or more uh, less money than they would have if they had just passively invested. That just comes from the fees that they've been paying out that compound over time percent every year. Then, uh, that's, uh, you know, that compounds because that's, that's, that's money that you're paying that person that is not invested and that therefore doesn't earn any for you. Uh, so I, I honestly think that, that if you want to have a personal advisor, and then a lot of what I know is in the U.S. context. So I think I would, I want to be modest about, about the Indian context. But if you want to get financial, advice, you go to someone, you pay them for their time by the hour. You say, oh, well, you're going to spend an hour and a half talking to me. I'm going to pay you five hundred dollars, and and that's it. And then I then I make my investments based on what you told me. I don't have you managing my money, and and I'm paying you continue for that because that's just not what they are good at. Uh, what they are good at is saying, you know, I see that your son has a real issue here. Here's some ways we can strategize so that when your son is 25, we we're you know you're 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 helping him in the right way. Or here's your let's talk about your life insurance. Let's talk about you know, uh, what happens if you get divorced? Questions like that. Questions like, Am is Amazon overpriced? Your advisor, that's just not, that's not what they're good at. Got it. So the, one of the points that you'd made earlier in your presentation was that they're good for certain things and they're not good for certain things. Absolutely. You can't expect complicated investment advice from them uh, uh, on stock selection and so on, because Absolutely. that's not what they're necessarily good at. They're probably good at guiding you, uh, asking you to exercise patience during trying times in the market and so on. Yeah, and they may say, you know, Harold, your house is too, you're trying to buy a house that's too expensive relative to, let's think about, let's think about what's sensible for you. Now, one of the problems we have in the United States is that people prefer to pay hidden fees than to pay visible fees. Yes, so when the yeah, so people, if, if somebody says, I want to, I'm going to charge $500 for an hour and a half to talk to you, a lot of Americans say, I'm not going to pay that. But if, if, if you say, if they say, I'm going to charge you 1% of your portfolio to manage it over time, people say, oh, that's fine. And that's, of course, a lot more money for most people. Yeah, yeah. We have the same problem here. Uh, people are willing to buy products which have an embedded fee rather than buy lower cost products where they have to write out a separate check, you know? So there's Absolutely. a reluctance to do that. Uh, so you have any ideas? Uh, some of our audience could be advisors on how they could overcome this particular challenge. I feel, for, I say I feel for advisors in that respect because, because I think advisors provide tremendous value for people, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't, but the business model doesn't match very well the value that is provided. I, th I think advisors, just to be straight up with people and to say, and to say, here's what here's what I have to offer you, and uh, I can help you. I can help you. By the way, I can tell you that a low fee index fund is what you should invest in. Uh, I can't tell you that Amazon is going to be better than Apple over the next ten years, but I can tell you, uh, you know, minimize your investment fees and let's talk about the things that you might need someone to talk to you about that are a little bit uncomfortable for you and you need someone who's not in your life to really give you some unbiased advice. And tell me, what, what, when do you want to retire? Let's think about what your investment has to look like. How much do you, how much, let's talk about how much you have to save over the next 20 years if, for you, if it were to be realistic for you to retire at age 65. Uh, let's talk about what's realistic, uh, you know, when you think about your, 
how much you can spend in your life on cars and vacations and housing and things like that. Advisors are great for things like that. And, uh, and I think if people, are, if, if people are straightforward, I think it will be refreshing to a lot of customers. They appreciate that, uh, the honesty of that. Uh, and sometimes, and, and also saying, by the way, the stock market's going crazy right now. Please don't do anything. Just sit tight. Um, that's the best thing to do. I know it's hard to do, but please yeah. sit tight. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things I would say. So, Aaron, uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was, in a manner of speaking, grand finale for the day. Really thank enjoyed you. your presentation. And uh, I think, uh, you know, you should come out with an Indian edition of your book. Which I would love that. With, you know, makes it more relevant for Indians to uh, I, kind of read your book. By the way, I want to thank all the staff. I was technically, uh, uh, I was not technically proficient and the staff uh, should be professional social workers because they talked me down and they did what the financial advisors should, what I was saying the financial advisors should do. They did for me as I was preparing for this presentation. So thanks very great. much to the staff. Great, and have a great day, Harold. You too. Yeah, and I hope to stay in touch with you.